First of all, I want to thank again everyone for being here, especially our veterans. And the theme of today's talk is remembrance. And I know what you're thinking, a talk on Remembrance Day about remembrance. How original. Well, I want to assure you that, uh, as Alexander Pope said, the true wit to advantage uh, dressed is what oft was thought but never so well expressed. So I hope today I can say things about remembrance that will be maybe new and original and they'll bring some insights. The theme of today's talk is really that the act of remembrance is much about you as it is about the fallen. And I want to start with the idea that this is a special day and I'd say even a sacred day. And what makes something sacred is sacrifice. In fact, in Latin, the word uh, sacred means to make sacred, if you were to translate more correctly to English. And that means something is sacred uh, because of the sacrifice made for it to become so. So Remembrance Day is made out of sacrifice. Now, do you recall one of the last scenes of the remarkable movie Saving Private Ryan? Well, Captain John Miller, played by Tom Hanks, asked Private Ryan to be worthy of the sacrifice his squad of seven soldiers made for him. Now, this is a central theme of that movie. The movie asks this generation, are you worthy of the sacrifice that these remarkable soldiers, sailors, pilots, and air crew made for you? Now, you might rather ask, how do I live worthy of such a sacrifice? And I think we live worthy of that sacrifice by keeping three promises we make on this day. And the three promises that we make are, for one, to never forget, meaning to have gratitude, to give thanks for all that's been given. And the second promise we make is to take up the torch passed to us by those who have fallen. The third promise is to honor those that gave us a sacrifice of their lives by being the best version of ourselves that we can be. Now allow me to go into a little bit of detail about that. Because today you're going to hear words like, we'll remember them unless we forget. So I think it's worth retelling some of the stories of sacrifice, of service, so that we can appreciate what's been done for us. And in that way we can keep the first promise, to never forget, meaning to have gratitude and give thanks for all that's been given. Now can you imagine, the war breaks out and, uh, war breaks out and half the young men in Lethbridge join up. Half. And that's almost exactly what happened in 1914 when World War I broke out, and then again in 1939. And that happened in city after city all across Canada. In fact, by the end of World War I, so many people were serving from Lethbridge in the military that there were no longer enough people to raise up another battery to go overseas for the war effort. But the battery was raised because those who were wounded early on in the war and who had recovered enough joined up again even though there was no expectation they do so. And they stood up that last battery to go overseas from the, those who had recovered from their wounds. By the time World War I was over, just over 60,000 Canadians had perished. And then in World War II, only 20 years later, another 40,000 Canadians would lose their lives in that conflict. Now to put that in perspective, that's the entire population of Lethbridge within three decades disappearing, losses all to war. And remember that for every one of those deaths, there were many, many times that who were wounded both in body and in mind. Now, after, or during those wars, when people were wounded or injured and killed in battle, names were sent home, and those long lists of names would send shockwaves to the communities. In fact, the war literally turned the lights off in small towns as those soldiers, sailors and airmen, who never came home, because they never came home, they never took up the farm. They never took up the business. And in many small towns in Alberta, they just ceased to exist by the end of World War II. At the end of World War II, the Canadian government would allow families to have messages written on the headstones in the cemeteries overseas. I had the honor of going to Ben Sumer, representing the battery. And that's a battery uh, that, that most of those who fell at D-Day were, uh, were returned. And there were two cenotaphs that really struck me and made me quite emotional because it's the words of the parents written on those headstones. And on the one it reads, in memory's garden we meet every day, mother and father. On another one it read, we will always remember our boy. Now as a father, I, I can't imagine the pain and the suffering the grief that those parents endured. And we can't help but think those parents literally gave everything for that war effort into this country. And I have to find it very difficult to even think about it without becoming emotional. All of those names we read on headstones and cenotaphs, like the ones here, they are reminders of a life that were given, in their dreams and their future, completely given to all Canadians. Now, their act for us 
is really meaningful, especially if we actually take the time to remember. So the act of remembrance only means something if we have the gratitude to receive the gift provided to us by those veterans. I want to quickly mention that we have a great example of service and sacrifice in this city of a man who I think many of us know the name, General Stewart. And General John Smith Stewart started serving his country uh, with the Boer War, but he actually came here originally to be a teacher. And when the war broke out, he joined the Lord South Dakota Horse, served in that conflict, and came back to Canada, <laughs> got an education, furthered his education, became a dentist, and set up his practice here in Lethbridge. Colonel Sam Steele was looking for places to start up different units in Western Canada, and he chose Lethbridge to stand up an artillery uh, battery. Now, why artillery in Lethbridge? Well, artillery in Lethbridge made sense because artillery used to be pulled by horses. And in a ranching area with lots of farmers, ranchers, and First Nations peoples that knew how to ride, it was a perfect place to stand up a battery. There were also many horses that could be rented here. So after years of diligent service, Major, then Major Stewart made a point of going off on courses and learning how to become an artillery officer, and he came back home with that knowledge and, and he grew the battery. By 1914, the war broke out, and he was called up to form the 20th Battery, which would go overseas and fight. He would be wounded twice and would rise to the rank of Brigadier General, and that's no small accomplishment for a reserve major from Lethbridge, Alberta. Today, his legacy lives on. The Lethbridge Legion bears his name, as does a public school in the city. The 20th Independent Field Battery, the battery that he formed to go overseas, is now and this is not just me bragging, but it really is the most vibrant and successful artillery battery in the Canadian Army. And today, the city is not only home to an artillery battery, but also the South Alberta Light Horse, who we have before us today. This is the Armored Reconnaissance Unit. Now, just recently, the Highlanders are returning to Lethbridge. In 1914, the 113th Lethbridge Highlanders were established. And if you go to Calgary and see Signal Hill, you'll see the numbers written in white stone, 113, and that's from the Highlanders from Lethbridge that were training in that area just before they deployed overseas. Today, the Calgary Highlanders are standing up a subunit here in Lethbridge. In fact, I would say that, um, without any exaggeration, that the city of Lethbridge has, a, has the largest citizen-soldier per capita ratio of any other city in Canada. And that's, General Stewart's life is a life, is an example of service. And it's an example of the sacrifice that's needed to keep our country free. I just briefly want to mention as well another example of service or example of sacrifice the experience that I came to me as a young man, I was going for a sleepover at a friend's house when I was in elementary school, and it was a Dutch mother who was serving us breakfast, and she told the story of her as a child, and her mother would go days without eating because the German army, when the war was on, would take the food from Holland and give it to their army, and the people had almost nothing to eat. The mother would go days without eating to make sure her children had food, and on one occasion, this, this woman told the story of her going down to the basement to get, or getting down to the root cellar to get a potato, and she came up, all there were were rotted potatoes left, and her mother wept because now there was absolutely nothing for her or her children to eat. So when she said that when the Canadians showed up to liberate Holland, that for the first time in her life, she found out what sweets were and knew what a full belly was. And she had tremendous gratitude for Canada, and that's why she ended up emigrating to this country. And when she told me that story, even though I was a young man, I, I remember feeling proud to be a Canadian. I felt proud that my grandfather was one of those veterans that went to Europe to free it. Now, as those experiences uh, as a young man really made an impression on me. And I think I really gained a sense of the meaning of that sacrifice which was given to us. Now, the second promise that we're given is to, that we make is to take the torch passed to us by those who have fallen. And uh, John McRae's famous words is, take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from falling hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. And those lines remind us that no generation gets a free ride. We all take, have to take our turn holding that torch. Now some generations pay a terrible butcher's bill, and other generations pay maybe less as a whole, but individuals and families still pay dearly. Canadian forces today carry that torch. 
Remember that from the 1950s through the 1990s in the Cold War, 130 Canadians died in UN peacekeeping missions. The Cold War saw 600,000 Canadians serve in that time period. Uh, today we have uh, Major Lafon and uh, Sergeant Major here today, and they are from the uh, from the 49 Bible Squadron. Correction, it was uh, Major Lepen Lepen and uh, Sergeant Major Lafon from the 49 Bible Squadron. They uh, they represent the Air Force here today, and consider this: that in that time period, 900 pilots and air crew died in training, and that's a that's no small bill. The Air Force and Navy also paid dearly, and of course in Afghanistan we lost 158 soldiers as well. And today we continue to see losses. In 2017, Master Corporal Alfred Barr from Lethbridge was killed in a training accident uh, a, with the 435 Transport Squadron. And this year the Royal Canadian Artillery lost one of its own as, as Bombardier Patrick Joseph Labrie was killed in a training accident in Bulgaria. The bill of eternal vigilance is being paid and will be paid so long as we're a nation. So what happens if we don't continue taking up this task that's been given us? Well, John McRae has a warning, and that is, if he break free of us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in founders' fields. In other words, if I can be so bold as to interpret the words of John McRae, if we don't take up our duty to those who have sacrificed, we've all done, their sacrifice has been done in vain. Now we make a third promise, and that promise was to honor those that gave us a sacrifice of their lives by being the best version of ourselves that we can be. Now our war dead didn't get the opportunity to grow old. So we honor them by doing our best to become the best version of ourselves that we can be. And we do that. We, we become the best version through service and sacrifice. And one of the most important concepts a member of the Canadian Forces learns is teamwork. And we learn that with our fire team partner. We know in our training where each other is at all times and we work hard for each other, we push each other and, and yes we often dislike each other for long parts of the day but in the end we know we're stronger together than we are apart and that is the foundation of the Canadian Forces and the organizational success of our forces is predicated on this idea of personal sacrifice as a foundation to our core values. When you see people who've gone through the training in the military it changes them and you can often tell who they are because they've been forced to work as a team and that team demands sacrifice in order to excel. You can tell often who have served in the military by why they carry themselves, the way they problem solve, the way they act, the way they lead, and yes, even sometimes the language they use. Now service and sacrifice define being a member of the Canadian Forces and we inherit that legacy from those who came to us before. But we as an institution don't just benefit from service and sacrifice, as so often those of us who've served, that service and sacrifice changes us for the better. Now some complain that the youth of today are not up to the challenge. They're not willing to sacrifice. And I don't think much of that. I rejoined the Army Reserve when I was 39. So I got to work with all of these young people. And I can assure you that the young men and women I've worked with are the brightest that Canada has to offer. The youth of today may appear different, and that's, that's absolutely for sure, but for all their differences, they unite wearing the uniform of this country. When asked, the youth of today rise to the challenge. The youth in Lethbridge are flocking to the call of their country. They're joining the Army, Air Force, Navy. And in Lethbridge, they come to serve the guns of the artillery, the patrol vehicles of the South Alberta Light Horse, and they answer the call of the Highland Bagpipes. And more than ever before, the youth of this city see their place in this world and their responsibility to it, not just in military service, but in every place service to their fellow man is required. Youth organization, like our cadet movement, teach those values of service and sacrifice. And if this continues, I have nothing but confidence for the future and for this coming generation. Now the current generation will find itself and its place in this world and become the better version of itself, not like a gold miner looking for themselves and eternal searching for who they are, but rather they will find it by building character through the effort of service and sacrifice. If you take up the torch, you will see your place in the world and you'll find your purpose. And in so doing, you'll do your part in honoring those that have made your life possible. Through service and sacrifice, our flight through life is sustained and in turn, our lives find meaning, purpose, and direction. We have received and are given life's greatest gifts and opportunities through service and sacrifice. This is the lesson we learn from those who dedicated their lives to family, community, and country. And this is why the act of remembrance is as much about you 
as it is about to fall. Thank you very much.